Hello everybody, it's Dan, your friendly fishmonger at dansfish.com, and today we're going to talk about the Amazon Puffer. Why? Because they're so cute. They're just the cutest little piggy that ever went to market. <laughs> they make a great aquarium fish. They're not too big. They're fairly peaceful, but they have some special care requirements. So we're going to get into that. We're going to get into natural history so we can find out where they come from and what their, their home is like in the wild. Before we do that though, I want to talk about puffers in general. There's a lot of them. There's 187 recognized species and they're highly variable. Most of them live in salt water. Anything from the giant like mola mola onto like the uh, three tooth puffer with the big flap down its chin. Wide variety. They live in the open ocean. They live in coastal areas. They live in estuaries. And a few of them, like the Amazon puffer, have moved into fully freshwater environments and are now separate from the ocean. They live their entire lives in freshwater, don't need any salt water. That's one reason I like the Amazon puffer. I don't like mixing salt. <laughs> so freshwater makes it easy. Now luckily, there's been a lot of research done on puffers. Scientists have been fascinated with them for centuries. Why? Well, number one, they're toxic. They have poison in their bodies, in their skin, in their organs. And if you eat them, you could die. So that's fascinating. Also, they have the smallest known genome for any vertebrate. A very small number of genes that make the whole organism function. That makes them very easy to study genetically. So there have been a lot of studies done on their genome, comparing it with the human genome. This makes it easier because there's less genes that you have to understand with the puffers. So small genome, venomous, strange little body shapes and body types have made scientists just fascinated with them, which is great because that means there's a lot of information on them that we can find if we'll do the work to read scholarly journals and the like. Science! Now almost all of the puffers in the world are saltwater. Puffers all came from saltwater, but over the millennia, a few of them have been like, hey, Look at this freshwater. There's no puffers here. I bet I could live here. That's called a freshwater invasion, when a saltwater species transitions into a freshwater environment. So several species of puffers have done that, including the Amazon puffer, the one we're going to talk about today. Now, these freshwater invasions first started occurring between 20 million and 78 million years ago. That's a widespread of time, I know, but scientists don't agree on anything. So some of them say 20 million years ago, some say 78 million years ago. That's not so important. What's important is the order in which they did it. They first uh, adapted to freshwater habitats in Southeast Asia, then they did it in Central Africa, and most recently, freshwater puffers appeared in South America. But they're much newer in South America. They haven't been there long. If you look at Asia and Africa, you'll find all kinds of diversity in the puffers. You'll find hairy puffers that sit in ambush predator, dragon puffers, that kind of thing. You'll find big old maboo puffers, tiny little pea puffers, all kinds of variety. South America, that's not the case. There's only two species of freshwater puffers in South America. One is the Amazon puffer, and one is its very close relative that was described in 2013, which is the puffer from the Tocantins River, Colomasis tocanensis. The only difference between the two is tocanensis doesn't have these little skin flaps on the chin that Amazon puffers have. Besides that, they're, they're the exact same thing. There's one other species in the genus. It's Pistachus, I think is how you say it. It means parrot. It's the, the same word basically as the family for parrots. So it's the parrot puffer. Now this parrot puffer is a saltwater puffer and it's the ancestor of the other two, the Amazon puffer and the Tocantinensis puffer. So the parrot puffer became its own species about 12 million years ago or so. And then a few million years ago, some of them went into freshwater and adapted and evolved into the Amazon puffer. Over time, it became a pure freshwater puffer. It no longer lives in salt water at all. So you don't have to mix your brackish or your salt water to keep them, which is fantastic. And they were very successful. This little Amazon puffer adapted to the entire Amazon basin. It can be found in like six or seven countries, I think. It's widespread. This is good for aquarists. It means that they're adaptable. It means that they're hardy. 
It means that they can adapt to lots of different kinds of water parameters and environments, so they're easier to keep in your aquariums than a very specialized species might be. So that's a plus for them. Now something else about their natural environment is it, it, it Now something else about their natural environment is it, it, it <laughs> The blooper reel is going to be strong on this one. Now something else about their natural environment is that it experiences massive seasonal changes. During the dry season, there's very little water, it's all in the river channel, but during the wet season, the water level regularly rises 30 feet or more, floods the river banks and goes out into the surrounding forest, and you get these big flood plain lakes. So, a ton of water available, species go out there and they breed and all the babies are raised up and it's a completely different environment, lots of food, lots of area, everyone's happy. But then the dry season comes, that all dries up and all the water goes back into the river channel and all that habitat goes away. So it's a highly variable uh, life cycle or seasonal cycle that these puffers have to deal with every year. So their reproduction is tied to the cycle, not surprising. What they do is they congregate on the banks of the Amazon River at these side channels, the places where when the water rises, it's gonna flow through these channels to flood the forest nearby. So they congregate there during the beginning of the wet season. The water level starts to rise, they spawn, and the little tiny underdeveloped puffer larva, they can't do anything for themselves, helpless little things, are flushed through this channel out into the flooded forest where there is a ton of food. A whole bunch of infusoria and little microscopic organisms have boomed there and there's a lot of food for them, which is good because they're pretty helpless. If you look at saltwater puffer species, often what they do is they go, they lay their eggs, they scatter them around, the eggs hatch and the babies join the plankton cloud. They don't have developed mouths, they can hardly do anything, they're just little larvae. They're not even fish fry yet, they're larvae. But because they're surrounded by this plankton cloud, which is just a ton of nutrition, they can get their nutrition and still be highly underdeveloped. Because the Amazon puffer only recently differentiated from its saltwater relative, the parrot puffer, it does the same thing. It hasn't yet developed the advanced brood care that a lot of puffers practice. A lot of puffers will create a nest, they'll lay the eggs there, they'll guard the eggs until they hatch, and then the little babies have a, a fighting chance. That doesn't happen with these guys. What happens with these guys is they scatter the eggs, they become part of the freshwater plankton cloud, if you will, and so they're kind of still tied to the saltwater mode of reproduction. So they live in these flooded forest lakes during the wet season. They're eating all this food, they're growing rapidly, and in the dry season what happens is that all dries up, the water level drops back into the Amazon River's main channels, and that's where the little puffers, the juvenile puffers, finish out their life. So that's the cycle. So they can survive in a flooded forest, not a lot of flow, a lot of food, a lot of shelter, all that, but they can also survive as adults and juveniles in the main body of the Amazon River, which has quite a bit of flow and is, is a big body of water. It's, no, I don't need to get into all that. I always do these little tangents that I don't keep. So how do we know this about the reproduction? Well, there was an academic named Carlos Arujo Lima, I hope I'm saying that right, who went out and studied the spawning habits of these puffers over the course of a year. And what he would do is he would go out in a big boat and he would seine the river. And he would collect with these nets with small mesh, he would collect puffer larvae to see where they were. And what he found was 97 plus percent of them were congregating around these little channels that would lead to the floodplain lake. So thanks to that study, we know quite a bit about how the Amazon puffer reproduces in nature. Now something else Carlos and his colleagues did was they measured the temperature in that area. And what they found was in the Amazon River where the puffers were, it was in the low 80s. So these guys do like it warm. Now that being said, they have a very wide habitat across many countries. So they can take some fluctuations. High 70s in our experience is just fine, but high 70s, low 80s, they should be happy. Something about the Amazon puffer that makes them different from almost all other freshwater puffers is they are gregarious. This is a community-minded fish. They like to be together 
and that's awesome. A lot of other freshwater puffers, you put two or more in a tank and you're gonna have a blood bath. But these guys don't do that. They live in aggregations in the thousands in the wild. They like being around each other. Now they do have a hierarchy. If you only put two in a tank, one's gonna be lower than the other, right? And it's not, there's no other puffer there for this other higher one to say, hey, I'm the big guy here too. And so that, that second one might get picked on. There is a hierarchy, but if you keep them in groups, that's mitigated and they do well together. I know someone who's kept them together in groups long-term for years, no problems. And I've kept them in groups as well. I think that's the way to do it. I think one might be lonely because they are gregarious. I think two or three might not be enough because they have a hierarchy. But I think if you got six or more, you'd probably be just fine. And you can do that. These guys top out in nature. The biggest one ever recorded was five inches. However, in the aquarium, I think you're looking at around three inches, four inches for a really big one, maybe. But I've never seen them bigger than, say, three to three and a half inches. What that means is that's a manageable size. Your average hobbyist can keep a tank big enough to keep a nice group of them in their home. So they are a very doable puffer. Something else that's different about the Amazon puffer is they're not a molluscivore. Most freshwater puffers we think of as molluscivores. They eat snails, mollusks, right? Snails, freshwater, shellfish, shrimp, crayfish, crabs. That's the kind of thing, crunchy stuff. And that helps wear down their, their beak, their teeth, right? Amazon puffers are different. There has been a study done on their diet and it found that 62.18% of their diet was insects. So this is an insectivore. This is a fish that eats bugs. Of that, 48.63% of the diet was mayfly larva, mayfly nymphs. So the majority of their diet is insects and almost all of that is mayfly larva. So they're not a molluscivore, they're an insectivore, but they do eat mollusks. 25% of an adult puffer's diet is snails. However, for the juveniles, it's only like six point something percent. These Amazon puffers don't have big mouths or really strong beaks. So they have trouble tackling snails, especially larger snails. So they can only eat the small ones. So keep that in mind. We do feed snails to our puffers here, but the way we do it is we crush the snail up a little bit before we feed it so that the puffer can, can get through the shell and get to the meat. So it's a little gross but it's the only way we found to get our Amazon puffers good snail content in their diet. So insects, most of the diet, snails a bit, and then the next thing in their diet is, this is gonna be a surprise, scales, fish scales. This is a scale eater. Not, not the majority of the diet, but they supplement their diet by going up to fish and nipping off a scale and eating it. Well, what that means is we're gonna have some ramifications in our aquariums, right? If we're keeping these puffers with other fish, there is the possibility that they will want to nip the scales off those fish. Now, I do know people that have kept Amazon puffers long-term for years in aquariums with other species in community tanks without any problems. It can totally be done. Maybe it's if they're kept with active swimmers, they're fine. Maybe if they're kept with more sedate fish that kind of sit in one spot, like, I don't know, an auto sinkless or a pleco, or I, maybe that's a fish they would nip on more. I'm not sure. I'm just saying we should be aware that they're a scale eater so that if you are keeping them in a community aquarium and you do notice some fish are starting to miss some scales, maybe we gotta change something. Maybe we need to separate something, right? So let's be aware of that. After the scales, which is 8.16% of their diet, 0.034% of their diet is algae, 0.06% of their diet is fish, and 0.03% of their diet is plants. So I don't think they're actually actively eating plants and algae. What I suspect they're doing is eating mayfly larva, and the mayfly larva has eaten the plants and the algae, and so when the puffer eats the mayfly larva, they get it in their, in their stomach, right? They're, they're gut loaded with algae and plants. Or maybe when they go to attack the mayfly larva, they scrape a little algae off the piece of wood or rock that the larva, the, that their prey is on and get a little piece that way, I don't know. And they're not a big fish hunter, again, 0.06% of the diet is fish, but it seems like if there's a little fish just sitting there, they might, they might grab it <laughs> opportunistically. So that's the diet, that's the breakdown. In our aquariums, we can mimic this fairly easily 
insectivore, we can feed bloodworms. Bloodworms are the larva of the midge fly, another aquatic developing insect similar to the mayfly. So bloodworms are a great diet for them. Now we want to supplement that. It shouldn't be all bloodworms all the time. We also feed here, we feed bloodworms, we feed mice, shrimp, brine shrimp, snails as we mentioned. We'll also give them Hikari Viber Bites. These are not picky fish. They'll eat prepared, dried, processed foods. But something that they need is a food that wears down their beak. All puffers need this. Amazon puffers, again, they're not great snail eaters. They're not big enough to crunch through, through a lot of shellfish. So how do we give them food that will wear down their beak? What we found works really well is we use gel foods like rapashi and we mix in some flaked oyster shell into the rapashi as we're mixing it up. And when that rapashi cools, it becomes this like gelatin basically with crushed oyster shell embedded in it. So we'll take a little bit of that rapashi food, feed it to the puffers, they'll eat it no problem. And as they're eating that, as they're chomping through it, their teeth come in contact with that flaked oyster shell and that helps wear down their teeth. So that's what we use to help with our puffer's teeth management. If you do that every other day or so, then not only will they get some vegetation in their diet, because rapashi foods have a well-balanced diet with veggies in it, it's also a way to help them keep their beaks in good trim. Now, if you do want to buy some rapashi and some flaked oyster shell, we do have an Amazon affiliate link down in the description. If you click on that, it'll take you to where you can purchase that stuff. And we'll get a little kickback, so thanks for your support if you do that. So we made another video on how to prepare rapashi with flaked oyster shell and feed it to the puffers. And we'll link that in the description down below so you can see kind of the details of how to make that happen. Now, as we mentioned before, one reason that scientists have been fascinated with puffers for so long is because they are poisonous. They store toxins in their flesh, in their organs, in their skin. And if you eat them, you could die. This is most famous with, the, with fugu, right? The Japanese delicacy that's, uh, that's prepared from the fugu puffer. And if it's not prepared perfectly, you can get sick or you could die. The reason is puffers have two types of toxins. One is tetrodotoxin. And the other is saxitoxin. The one that the Amazon puffer has is saxitoxin. And saxitoxin is not something the puffer makes. It's something the puffer eats. It's kind of like a poison dart frog. Poison dart frogs are not poisonous, but they eat ants, and ants have uh, acids and chemicals in them, poisons in them. And as the poison dart frog eats more and more ants, those toxins get more and more concentrated in the skin of the frog, and if you eat that frog, you're gonna die. Same with the puffers. These uh, saxi toxins are produced by algae, certain blue-green algae, so their prey Little mayfly nymphs are going to be eating these algae. The puffer eats the mayfly nymph, ingests some of that saxy toxin, and instead of pooping it out, keeps it and concentrates it within its body. And the more it eats, the more concentrated it gets. So that's how a puffer becomes poisonous. Now this is potent stuff. A dose of 0.57 milligrams, about one eighth of a standard grain of rice is enough to kill an adult human. What it does is it prevents the nerve cells from transmitting to the next nerve cell. So you got this chain of nerve cells, the signals from your brain telling your foot to move or whatever, travel along this chain of nerve cells, and then your foot moves. But if these nerve cells can't transmit from one cell to the next, it can't move the message down the chain, you become paralyzed, and in severe cases, your heart stops. So the good news is, you have to eat the puffer, you have to ingest it for this to happen. If, if you're playing with your puffer and it gives you a little nip, it's not injecting venom into your body like a snake would or anything like that. The, the toxins are stored in, in the puffer's body and you'd have to eat the puffer for it to be a problem. So don't eat your puffer and we'll all be okay. Message of the day, don't eat your puffer and you'll be fine. Stop eating your pets, people. So I find Amazon puffers fascinating and the cutest little things ever. They're personable, they kind of get to know their owner, they'll interact with you quite a bit more than a lot of other fish species. They become a real pet. Hopefully by learning a little bit about their natural history and how they behave in the wild and their habitat in the wild, we can uh, know how to take better care of them in our aquariums. That's the goal. 
Now, if you've made it this far in this video, obviously you're a real fish nerd. You like fish and I've got something for you. We do a live stream every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time on the Dance Fish YouTube channel and we geek out about fish. We talk about how to keep fish, how to breed fish. We talk about the fish industry. We talk about how to ship fish. It's just a total fish geek out. So if that's your jam, feel free to join us. Thanks for watching everybody. Until next time, I hope you have a good one. Um, bye bye. Hey everybody, this is the voice of Dan. You know how everybody's always telling YouTubers to always do an end screen so that people will do stuff? Well, I'm doing that now too. And if you would like to do stuff, one thing that you could do is subscribe to this channel. Also, we make a living by selling fish at dansfish.com. So if you wouldn't mind clicking that if you're looking for any fish for your aquariums, we'd appreciate that too. Anyways, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.